evening, everyone. Tonight we will find ourselves in Revelation chapter 3 and looking at the faithful church of the seven churches. This is, uh, this is quite a study here on the church at Philadelphia. Uh, we have very little information about this place as well uh, in the New Testament. But we do see that at the point which time the book of Revelation was written, that they, they were doing uh, a pretty good job of, uh, of maintaining their faithfulness to Christ, which is uh, quite extraordinary considering the times in which they existed. Let's go ahead and have a prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll begin looking at this letter. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for the day that you've blessed us with. It's been a full day, Father, and we thank you. We thank you for the time of worship, the time of study, the time of fellowship that we've enjoyed. And we thank you for bringing us back once again. We pray, Father, that as we look into your word, that you would encourage us and strengthen us with it. In Jesus' name, amen. We have very little in the way of archaeological remains, which you're going to see here in just a moment. But once again, here's Ephesus. This is modern-day Turkey right here. Here's Ephesus, and in chapter 18, we see that all of Asia was being evangelized uh, while Paul was in Ephesus teaching. And we see our seven churches here. We have Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, in addition to Ephesus. And so we're making our way around here, and here we are at Philadelphia, which sits right out in this region. This is it. This is all we got left. It's a couple of massive columns and a few foundation blocks sitting around. And otherwise, it's been, it was either destroyed or it's been raised to make room for other uh, buildings in the area. So there's very little that is in existence uh, from the time that this letter was written. But it is a city that was founded by Attalus II around 140 B.C., and his love for his brother Eumenes was so great that his nickname was Brother Lover. And as a result, the city he founded became known as the City of Brotherly Love, Philadelphia. He intended the city to serve as a center of uh, spreading the Greek language and Greek culture throughout all of Asia. And his work there was so successful that by around the first decade A.D. that nothing was spoken except Greek in Philadelphia. The Greek language was one of the tools that God used to put in place over time to allow for the rep rapid spread of the gospel. And it may to a certain extent contribute to some of the challenges that Jesus lays before the church in Philadelphia that we'll look at here in just a few moments. It was located uh, on a fertile plain, which led to a lot of prosperity because the vineyards produced very well, and there was a lot of uh, wine production that took place in this area. Uh, the city had many temples, pagan temples, and it was uh, referred to by people outside of the area that would travel through as a little Athens because it did have so many temples in the area. And it was on imp very important trade routes, which anytime you had a city that sat on those trade routes, it allowed you to take advantage of that, and you would prosper because of the commerce that would pass through the area. Over the course of the history of Philadelphia, there were several major earthquakes that did everything but destroy the region. And there was an earthquake in A.D. 17 that left very little standing, and Tiberius... Uh, the emperor at the time, he was emperor from uh, 14 through 37, Tiberius offered a very generous gift for the rebuilding of the city. And thus, by the time we have this letter being written to the Christians there in Philadelphia, 
uh, they were basically existing in a brand new city. So they, they had a lot of, lot of new that was there. Now, our letter is found in verses 7 through 13 in the third chapter. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading of his word. We have here Jesus' self-identification as he judges his church, and it doesn't give any reference to the identification that we see in chapter 1. So far, it is the only letter that does so. But he identifies himself as holy. And we know that Jesus, of course, is quite holy as the one who is true. Jesus even testifies and says, I am the truth. But then there's this confusing reference where he says, I have the key of David and I open and no one shuts and I shut and no one opens. This is a reference to Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22 where King Hezekiah had a keeper, had a key to the, to the throne of David, so to speak. And it was only through this keeper that a person could get to the king and into the presence of the king in order to speak with him. And so it is a reference going back to that time. And then we look at that and we know that Jesus stands in a very special relationship between God and man. And it is only through the God-man Jesus, as Paul refers to him in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, that we have access to. He is our go-between, our intercessor, our mediator that goes between. And here Jesus is testifying to that using an Old Testament reference. In John chapter 14, verse 6, where he says, I am the truth, he also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He has the key to David. And if he opens, no one can close it. And if he shuts it, no one can open it. And so that's what this reference is that is made to Jesus. He acknowledges the condition of the church in a positive sense. He says, you have an open door before you. Because you have kept my command to persevere. Because you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This is so important to understand. Because they were faithful, God was increasing their opportunities. I think that there are a lot of churches... Uh, which I am familiar and, and those which I am not, but I think the principle applies, that when there's turmoil or unfaithfulness in the church, God finds a way to prevent that from spreading. 
And a lot of those churches don't grow. That have turmoil. And you have to either fix the turmoil or the turmoil has to fix itself and go away before an, an opportunity for growth and expansion occurs in the church. I think God protects people from dysfunctional church families. And here we have a church family that is not dysfunctional and God has opened a door for them. He's, he's expanded their opportunity. He says they have a little power and they understood that their power came from Christ. It was not of their own. But this is, this is the best. I mentioned this a moment ago. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. Now you've got to remember they were in the midst of a persecution, a trial. Jesus goes on to say here uh, in a few verses that because you have done these things, I will make sure this trial is not like it is to the rest of, of the world. Theirs was going to be limited in many capacities as related to how other churches in other regions were going to suffer during this time. He acknowledges their condition in the negative, and guess what? He has nothing negative to say about the church. You remember last week with Sardis? He had nothing good to say about the church. This week, Philadelphia, he has nothing negative to say about this church. Now, I want to, to step forward about 2,000 years and step into our congregation and, and think about this, Sardis and Philadelphia. Where on the spectrum between those two congregations do we sit? If Jesus was to make an assessment, would we be more like Sardis? Or would we be more like Philadelphia? Where do we want to be? Because wherever we are on that spectrum, we, we have the power to change that. If we exert our will in the proper fashion, obviously we will move more toward the church at Philadelphia. If we exert our will in a negative fashion, we will move our way back toward the church at Sardis. But I find it curious to, to go through that mental exercise. If Jesus was writing a church to us today, where would we fall as far as what he would say about us? And if we don't like the answer that pops into our head, then what are we going to do about it? Because it falls to us to make the changes necessary where we can be acceptable. So he makes an appeal to them, and he appeals to them to remain faithful. In other words, stay in the condition in which you are right now. Now that, that is an odd thing because for the most part, throughout all of the scriptures, we are constantly told to grow and to improve and to become more like Christ. And here is a congregation that he says, remain faithful. Not that they didn't have work to do, but you remain faithful. What a beautiful challenge that Jesus presents to them. Not you need to become faithful. Not you need to put out Jezebel or, or some of the other false teachers that were in your congregation. But I'm, I'm appealing to you to remain faithful. I think that would definitely be his appeal to every congregation that has a semblance of faithfulness within it. He tells them to hold fast so that no one takes their crown. We just sang two songs about victory. And the victory wreath, the victory crown, the Stephanos that is spoken of here, they had already acquired the victory. Not the final victory, of course, but they were living a victorious life because they were faithful. 
What a blessing that is when we consider that Jesus came to give us the abundant life. We've examined on a number of occasions that that abundant life is not something just future in heaven, but it was an abundant life to be lived here and now. And here is a church that already is enjoying the victory even before they enter into their heavenly home. Because you can't take away something that's not there. Hold fast so that no one takes your crown. They had it already. That, that is a great example of something for which, to which we should strive so that we also can be victorious. And then he says, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. I will make you a pillar. A pillar is something that is firm. It is steadfast. And of course, the temple refers to the covenant people of God, his church. Uh, he promises some blessings to them. The first is that the name of my God will be their name. In other words, they will bear the family name of deity. Now we as Christians wear that royal monarchical name, the name of Christ. We are Christians. We belong to him. And that's a beautiful name that we have. You know, I'm I can remember my dad telling me on a few occasions when I probably deserved an even sterner talk than he was giving me. He says, you know, when, when you are out there, you've got to remember your name. Some of you may have had similar conversations with parents or grandparents or others where uh, they told you, you, you need to remember your name. Well, my dad had worked diligently to make my last name, my surname, uh, a respected name. He had worked very hard. And he had served 30 years in the United States Marine Corps. He had volunteered for combat duty. He had led his unit in Vietnam to become the highest decorated Marine Corps unit in the war. He brought most of his boys home safely, not all of them. Retired as a lieutenant colonel. Remained a faithful Christian through the entire process. Was a Bible class teacher. You know, he, he worked very hard to have a good reputation for the name. How much harder has Jesus worked for his great name? And so my charge to you and my challenge to you and the challenge as this blessing is being pronounced to the Church of Philadelphia is, you know, when you go out there, you need to remember your name. You need to remember who you are. He says that you will have the name of my God. Secondly, you will have the name of the city of God. That is the new Jerusalem. And that signifies where our citizenship lies. And so we not only wear the, na the holy name, the name of deity, we also know that our citizenship is in that holy city. I just had to renew my passport. It expired right after I returned from Guyana this time. And as I was going through and filling out the paperwork and going through all of the, the hoops you have to jump through, uh, it's a lot harder to get a passport nowadays than when I got, got my first passport back in 1980 or 81. You, your name has to be there. And your citizenship has to be there. And so what is being described to us is our heavenly passport, in a sense. And Philadelphia, the, the Christians there, well, they, they, they had their stamp. They were ready to go. 
They were prepared. He says they, he was even going to promise them his own new name. The name under which the blood that saves us and provides us the victory. And so you, you look, you know, we're not going to wear our own name. We need to wear the name of the one who purchased us. That was a very common practice in America back in the 1700s and the 1800s uh, during the time of, of slavery is that you took the surname of whoever your master was. And many of them chose to change those names once they had been set free. Others chose to keep the name for whatever reason. And they were given the choice to do so. We have been purchased from slaves of sin by Jesus Christ and his blood and been made slaves of righteousness. When you look at Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, that into the name of Jesus Christ right there is a very special construction in the original language. And it's a legal construction that we find on slave documents during the first century that when I sold a slave to you I was selling the slave into the name of that special construction in Acts 238 right there is critical to understanding Romans chapter 6 where we go from being slaves of sin to slaves of righteousness Jesus purchased us out of that and we were written into the name of Jesus Christ. He's now our, ma our master, our Lord. The name of my God, the name of the holy city, the new name that I have, these are going to be here. That those are special blessings to give someone a name that is above all names. So he tells his church, I have prepared for you an open door. It is believed by the majority of people who have studied this text that that open door was an open door of opportunity to preach and share the gospel, the good news with those round about. And as a result, they were going to be protected from the intensity of the persecution that was coming because God saw, Jesus Christ himself saw them and their faithfulness and decided that they would be the ones. They would be the ones to share. They were the faithful church of the seven churches from the city of brotherly love. They were wearing the victory crown. They were awaiting those precious names to be applied to them. That we should be following in the steps of that church is without question. Our aim, our desire should be to be that church. Of all the churches we've looked at so far, we, we see faithfulness, we see unfaithfulness, we see a combination of those things. But this church in Philadelphia, I'm, I'm telling you, if, if we are abiding in and keeping the word and not denying the name, abiding in the word of God, we've got a door of opportunity that is awaiting us here. To share the gospel in an area that is, quite frankly, among the, the areas within the United States is more hostile towards religion. It's not as welcoming as some parts of the country. You know, some parts of the country, you know, it's, it's come one, come all, we're just happy to have you, and, you know, we'll do whatever we can to help you out, and, and we're in an area where it's not quite that. And let me tell you, that's okay. 
because we see the church growing in the first century amidst much stronger and violent persecution than we've ever seen. And the church grew and took advantage of opportunities. We can too. We can too. We need to be faithful, we need to be strong, and we need to take advantage of every opportunity that we have to be that light, to be that salt, to show Christ to a lost and dying world. If we were on that spectrum, where would we be? Between Sardis and Philadelphia. My prayer is we'd be more like Philadelphia with each passing day. That if Jesus came in and made an assessment of us today, he would find no fault with which to criticize us in the living. That needs to be our goal every day. Victory in Jesus. What a beautiful hymn we sing. That, that is a, a powerful and challenging hymn. And tonight, maybe you're not enjoying victory. I don't know. Maybe you've fallen back, or maybe you've never started in the first place. You've never put him on in baptism. You've never named his name. Having believed in him, never repented, never been immersed for the remission of your sins. I'd like to encourage you tonight to give very strong consideration to that. We have such a limited time here on earth, and none of, no, none of us knows what tomorrow holds. But if you're here and you've done those things, maybe you've fallen back, you want to come back and become faithful, maybe you've suffered some discouragement, some sickness, other type of things you'd like for us to pray with you and encourage you tonight, we'd like to do that for you. Our brother's prepared a song, It Is Well With My Soul. Please make your need known to us as you go to these services.